Hello, listeners. Thank you for joining me here on the latest episode of Hitting Your Stride. Today's guest is the personification of determination. He's chased his dreams, putting hour after hour of hard work in to get where he is today and is a fantastic example of where you can go when you set your mind to it. We all know it can be an uphill climb at times, building a name for yourself in the equestrian industry, let alone building a business for yourself based on riding and training horses, sales and coaching. Ray Butterfield of Hazelcrest is here with me to share just what this process has been like for him and some of the things he's learned about himself along the way. Welcome, Ray. Thanks, Tracy. Glad to be here. Awesome. Thank you for taking the time. I know <laughs> it's always a challenge trying to, you know, in busy schedules, set these things up. So I appreciate the time you've taken me, taken for me today. Oh, right. I, I wouldn't have. I wouldn't have it any other way, Tracy. Oh. <laughs> All right. So let me just run off some points I have on your general general info on your bio, and we can expand on this as we go through this conversation. So you were from Bermuda originally, but you have ties to Canada through your mom. You have had the great experience of learning from such wonderful individuals such as Dave Ballard, Hugh Graham, and Matt Cohn. You have had the opportunity to travel and compete at Spruce Meadows and the Winter Circuit in Florida. And currently, you and your wife, Scarlett, are quickly building names for yourselves with coaching and sales with a niche in the young horse development. How'd I do? That, that sounds fantastic. <laughs> okay, perfect. All right. Anything you want to add to that? Yeah, um, I I heard what you said towards the end there, and I, I guess uh, from an onlooker's point of view, it is all happening very quickly, and I'm sure you can uh, attest to the fact that the days just blow by, and you know, your partner at the end of the day, or uh, you know, you speak to a family member at the end of the day and they say, how was your day? And you're like, oh my goodness, I don't even know what time it is right now. And so <clears throat> I would say for the most part, it, it has been uh, progressively growing for us, Scarlett and I. Um, but there, you know, there are times where you know, things can can seem a little bit like it's taking forever, you know. Uh, it, and, and so, you know, without touching on too many of those aspects, I'm, I'm proud to say that we're definitely heading in the right direction. And, um, you know, we're, we're really focusing on creating a, almost a nice barn sanctuary for uh, people that enter and, and of course the animals, uh, the horses that enter into our program as well. You know? Yeah, no, that sounds like a, a great approach and a, a great energy behind it. You know, I've known both you and Scarlett for many years. So the two of you together as a team isn't surprising to me at all. And you both have great, great qualities that you, you bring into that team and, and working with, you know, my own husband and different aspects of a, a business. I know what it's like. So at times it can be a little challenging, <laughs> but you know, at the end of the day, you have someone that has your back completely. Completely. And, you know, I think a lot, there's a lot to be said for partners that choose to do this together. I know many families uh, and, and, and many couples that one of them is in it and the other one is not. And I think it takes a very unique and strong uh, partnership to choose to do this together. Um, I think the beauty of uh, Scarlett and I is that we have a range of of ideas you know there's a lot obviously that we 
agree on. Uh, a lot of information that we share that more or less comes back to the same point. Um, but she, in reality, has a lot of hunter experience and knows how to get a hunter to the ring. And a lot of the time that I spent in the ring was in the jumper ring. So then when you mix the two together, um, I think it, it really makes it easy for horses and riders to develop. Yeah, absolutely. And that was something I was going to ask you though, too. This is, um, I see you riding a lot of hunters now. It, it, do you, do you have a, a favorite ring to be in <laughs> or is it just following where your talents go? You know, I have started really to enjoy the hunter ring i i um with dave was introduced to it on ponies but i never had an opportunity to ride as a junior hunter i never you know before meeting scarlet knew what it was like to ride like a classic performance hunter or a combined working hunter and in fact when i met scarlet that was the first time I had ever seen, you know, three foot six jumps with, you know, I felt like yards of flowers in front of them. And, you know, it's a whole different world over there. And so, you know, a lot of it, a lot of the finesse part of being in the huntering is right up my alley. Like I love, you know, how straight you have to have the horses and and how important it is to get not just have a lead change but a good lead change you see some of the on these sales ads and so uh you know just the the details i mean for a long time i thought it was just the hunter ring but it carries i think you know in our modern uh day sport and definitely uh, if you're if you're looking at it from an industry point of view, the hunter ring is just as the jumper ring, and and you get rewarded for riding well, for your horse jumping well, its presentation, and so um, yeah, I'm spending a lot of time there, but I mean, everyone that knows me well knows my heart is in the jumper ring. There you go. Okay. <laughs> Good. Okay, so let's take it back a little bit then. You mentioned that the more typical sports for a boy in Bermuda were swimming, soccer, and track and field. What exactly was it about the equestrian sports that called to you? And in your biography, you mentioned the care element was a big draw for you. What Can you explain that? Yeah, huge. Uh, I... I found myself often learning the the sport aspect of the of the um, of horses, you know, paying a little attention to how to ride and but more sort of wanting to know about the clockwork of the horse. And so that really um, was something that I was interested in from an early age and um you know it it carries through to what I believe in now uh you know my mother she took to it pretty early on as well like she could tell that I was uh heavily invested in the whole idea but then you know she if you were to go and visit my mom in Bermuda her house is immaculate and so, you know, she wanted horses turned out that way too. And so I think perhaps a little bit of that gene was carried over uh, through her to me. And then for me, I was drawn a lot towards how to curry a horse properly and, and body clipping. And, and, you know, there was a special kind of oil that I knew that was better than the others if you wanted their hooves to pop you know going down to the ring and so um 
and and it is important. I think there's a lot of people that can ride well, but can't really diagnose uh, if something is wrong with their horse. And so, you know, if you can mix in your talent in the ring uh, to your knowledge uh, on the ground, I think that um, it's of an extreme importance these days. And a lot of young people, I think, they don't miss it, but they should focus on it a little more. Right. You know? So your combination of, so I, I guess the detail of things that you were looking for, you couldn't find in swimming or soccer. <laughs> there was a sense of partnership you were looking for? Totally. And, and just the, you know, even the equipment aspect, like before, before you even get yourself dressed for the ring, there's so many little bits and pieces that the horse needs, you know, and, and, and so uh, I remember um, having like my own cork box from a very early age because I saw, I asked someone, what is this in their shoes? You know, and, and the farrier would say, oh, those are just some little studs that we put in for the road, you know, in his Bermudian. Uh, <laughs> and so I was interested in corks all of a sudden, how there's different various shapes of them and um, um like I mentioned before, the brushes, you know, the difference between hard brushes and what they do and soft brushes and what they do. And I had an, I had my favorite hoof pick because you, you buy just a, you know, a little $2 hoof pick. It's not as good as a $12 hoof pick, mm -hmm. you know? And so, and so, um, oh yeah, I loved, and I still do. I, I, I love that whole part of it just as much as I love the riding part. Nice. So the preparation from the ground up, literally. Literally. <laughs> I got stood on. Don't don't get it twisted. I got stood on and bitten a couple of times because I, you know, wasn't paying a lot of the attention. But you know, to a degree, if you can almost do the next time round, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So what was the turning point for you that helped you get serious about riding? Oh, um, you know, I think, I think it had a lot uh, to do with how I focused a little more on, on riding than on school, to be honest, <laughs> you know, I, <laughs> I and you know I was I was an okay student in school but I just had I just had this extra amount of of focus when I was uh you know coming into my teens I would say and um I was really I struggled with it a lot because I often remember my parents saying you know if you just focus more on your schoolwork as much as you did on your riding and uh you know, so the, 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 the turning point for me would be, you know, in my teens, when obviously school starts to get really important, you're nearing the end of high school, and you have to start making decisions about what your life's going to be like after. And um, I always chose the horses, always, you know. Did you know back uh, then that you wanted to make like a business of it? 100%. Okay. One. I, there was no question. I would, I would say that perhaps even uh, the trainers that I met when I was younger in Bermuda would have said if they, if he was going to pick one thing to do for the rest of his life, it would be this, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I think my parents um, also shared that view as well. Um, the horse business, I think, has always been tough. So I don't know if it was exactly what they would have wanted from me, uh, but they knew that I just poured myself into it before I was even 10 years old, you know. Wow. Yeah. <clears throat> so I think, you know, with your three influences that you shared with me, one of them being Dave Ballard, um, so he was your coach in Bermuda, was he? Can you share with us a little bit about that? 
Dave Ballard uh, at one point was the national coach for Bermuda. Huh. And so the way I remember it happening was that uh, there was a trainer um, that knew Dave quite well that lived in Bermuda. And she had organized clinics originally with Dave. And then one thing led to another and he was coming there so often uh, and the level of riding then was starting to progress. And I think in, in many countries it peaks and it valleys. So at this particular moment, you know, it was peaking and, um, and, and Dave then became our national coach. Yeah. Okay. So it was, a, yeah. it was a pretty easy flow then for you to come to Canada and sort of start working with him first exactly i like i said before i started uh in the the pony ring with the ballards and i mean their farm at that point was in hornby which was probably a mile or two north of the 401 and uh um i learned the ropes through dave he had invited me to come up for a summer and then one summer turned into two and then so on. And uh, that was also back when there was hardly, the only grass at Paul Grave was out in the back 40. You know, <laughs> like it was, it was sand everywhere. I mean, the pavilion was, was uh, made of wood at the time, like everything, you know, and so, um, so yeah, I have very fond memories. That was that was the first time I had learned that there was even such thing as a camper. Because <laughs> there, there, there was like there was no need or I yeah, there was no need for campers in Bermuda. And uh and so I remember arriving and uh getting to the horse show and where I slept was on a lowered table with some cushions on and and so I was like oh okay well this is gonna be interesting <laughs> and uh and 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 even it, you know still to this day my mom and I we joke about how shocked I was to to um I mean, at the time, I, th I thought it was great. Like, you know, there was no real sort of uh, um, room, you know, you were really just roughing it, you know. And so I, I, I thought that part of it was cool, but I was definitely shocked to find out where I was going to be sleeping. Yeah. And, but, <laughs> but, but, but that's what you do, right? If you're trying to maximize the hours in your day, you got to be right on site, right? That's awesome. Yeah. And you, uh, you obviously took to it quite serious, seriously, took advantage of it. I've, yes. owned, I've, I've owned two campers now since. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so talk about the influence that Dave Ballard had on you and subsequently how you've managed to apply those things now later in life. Oh, the course walk. The course walk definitely is the one thing that stands out uh, that I learned from Dave. Dave, and I, I, I kind of, you know, do it on my own time still today. He would, he would have you close your eyes and walk a 12-foot pole. And uh, if your walk strides did not match exactly the length of the pole, which means that you would either fall six inches short or walk at a foot long or whatever, then that wasn't good enough for him. Hmm. Like he was, he was adamant that if you were walking, you needed to walk on a 12 foot stride, which we all know is standard pretty standard whether you're riding the hunters or the jumpers and then to know the stride length of your horse as well you know you can you can walk a course given a 12 foot 14 foot stride here and there in a line but you have to have a a, a sense of the stride length of what you're sitting on as well and so you know he was very detailed in that uh 
in that aspect. Sandy, um, for me at least, she was more the one that helped me on the ground with the ponies. And then Aaron, I mean, she does led by example. You know, yeah. still to this day, Aaron is, is a flawless rider. And so because she had been immersed in it from such a young age, we were all just trying to beat her, you know. Yeah. Uh, and so that in itself, having somebody in the camp that was so good, you know, you try to aspire to be like like that rider, right? Yeah. So you were a sponge. Mm -hmm. You were just trying to soak up everything you could. As much as I could at at the time and at that age, I think I think I was probably 10, you know, between 10 and 13 years old, I was coming up to Paul grade. Okay. Um, and so, you know, how much does a, a child at that age absorb? Yeah, that's it, I true. guess it depends on, I guess, I, I guess it depends on how much you want it, right? Yeah. Yeah. If, if it's something that, want, that, if it's something that comes naturally to you, then yeah, it's going to be something that you're going to be interested in and it's not going to feel forced at all. So of course you're going to want to spend all day learning and riding and yeah. Yeah. At the end of the day, uh, soon did I forget the table that I was sleeping on because I was so, I was so exhausted, you know. <clears throat> So do you teach, do you help teach your students how to walk this course? How to, you know, are you just as diligent as Dave was? Um, I, I would say that my students would agree with that. Yes, that I uh, am pretty detailed with my course walks. And we're not just talking about, you know, the jump, the number, at the jump, you know, this one, this is two, like we're talking about the turns and square turns and, 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 you know, uh, and, and some, and some of the people that I've helped in the last couple of years, I've just asked them, you know, do you like to course walk? Have you course walk? Some of them say yes, some of them say no. And so depending on what answer I get at that time, I choose to go in a certain direction with, okay. uh, walks or even warm-ups you know uh there's there's a lot that goes into producing a good round in and any hunter ring and any jumper ring and so you know if you get the opportunity to course walk which these days it's fun you can course walk the derbies and so i i i particularly uh take take it very seriously you know and and it shows i think as well in the ring people that have a really good understanding of the track in front of them and the people that don't you know i like that the track in front of them that's good that's good yeah so what are what was your mentality when you first began riding and how did it progress as you moved along in your riding career so basically like every rider changes their mentality perhaps from time to time when they begin to mature in the saddle so what was some of the changes you recognized in yourself? Yeah, I, so following the Ballards, I, I moved uh, to Hugh Graham and Hugh Graham at the time worked for King Ridge, which is in King City. And uh, the young horse, or the breeding program at King Ridge was so busy that having learned what the competitions are like and then moved to a very rigid uh, breeding program, it opened my eyes a lot because there were stallions and there were, you know, fields of, of horses out together and, you know, you would you would have to go and feed a bunch of them and you can't just put the feed buckets down, you know, one foot uh, in between another one, like they had to be spaced out. And some of these horses, uh, uh, like if one wasn't at the north end, the feed bucket wasn't at the north end of a paddock, 
and then you didn't strategically put the second one down quick enough so that the third one that was out there didn't get to the second one's food and all this stuff, then you would just mess up the whole system, you know? And, and, and so I was blessed to have that opportunity because I think if you have an understanding of how these animals are before a lot of these riders get to know them as 10, 12, 13, 14 year olds, then you are really getting your hands in there in a sense of understanding how they tick. And, you know, some of them like cross ties some of them don't some you know and so Hugh really influenced me in that way on how to manage the animals from a very delicate stage you know Hmm. okay Mm -hmm. yeah like through this conversation and knowing you as I have over the years I'm learning even more that you are all about detail so you know you go from a youngster like you said talking about learning the detail in the ring to then all of a sudden you've got these, this breeding farm, which is a totally different intention, but just as much, if not more to learn. Um, So you are all about the details. So when you came out of that situation and moved on to your next um, riding opportunity, what did you take with you? Where was your mentality at? Uh, well, more specifically, and some people might laugh at this, but Hugh was an integral part of my learning the equitation ring. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, many, many will firmly argue that Hugh is no equitation master <laughs> himself. <laughs> Um, but he knew how to get somebody there. And, and, um, so that kind of was the, the beginning stage of, of me, um, really sort of saying, okay, so there's the equitation ring, what's next? And, uh, really just bigger jumps and and so i think a lot of the um world-class riders you know that go to the olympics and uh represent their countries at international competition have an immaculate uh equitation background like they they make jumping a meter 60 look like two foot and and so um when I moved, I sought out uh, Mac Cohn, and Mac was the one that really uh, sort of drilled me on the details of how you start jumping larger jumps and how you present your horses, you know, correctly, even if your horse is maybe not so easy, uh, you know, how to really get horses um, using themselves correctly and that takes a whole another level of rider and it's not good enough to come to the jump a little crooked and it's not good enough that you know your turn wasn't uh didn't carry as much importance as the actual jump itself and so mac was the the one that i would say uh really polished my ride as a trainer and, um, you know, there, there is, I think, you know, a, a, a level of equitation that does mix with jumping bigger jumps. And we see it, I think, on a very global stage, you know, the riders that focus on it a little more are the riders that jump more clean rounds and, 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 um, and also how they, they, they present their horses to the jumps as well and I think that just comes from good flat work and Mac is all about that always has been and always will be you know yeah Mm -hmm. good okay so at Hazelcrest which of your influences 
come through to you the most regarding horse development? Uh, well, these days, I would say that it's, it's you know, uh, a young horse um, sort of, uh, uh, the, the young horse development is something that I think people think of when they hear the name uh, Hazelcrest or see right. the name Hazelcrest. Um, and so um, my time spent with you, I would say, in that aspect um, comes through the most. Um, but, you know, it's funny because all of them just, you know, throughout the day and at various competitions, anyone I've ever had any help from is always, you know, a little voice in my mind uh, just randomly when I see, mm -hmm. you know, situations or someone comes to me and they have a, a problem that they need resolved or, you know, even if, if there's a small victory, you know, I'm, I'm quickly reminded of a saying or a moment um, that uh, uh, I shared with each of those trainers. But, you know, uh, Scarlett and I, we, we do have um, kind of this oblivious passion for young horse development, you know, that we're, we're embarking on. And, and, and so <clears throat> like I said to her the other day, you know, I think it's really something here, like we're doing it, but we're not even really realizing that we're doing it. And we are, I think, very strong in that area. And, 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 and I actually think, I thought about this the other day too, I think it's filling a gap in the industry. You know, um, there's a lot of really good breeders locally uh, they've had to step up their game and they are uh, uh, because of, you know, the, the, the pandemic. So people think what's happening is, is that feeds a business like ours in that if you uh, advertise that you are willing to and like to take on young horses, then um, there are there are are uh, barns like ours or other barns like ours that will cater to that, right? Yeah, no, I agree. And until you said that, I never really thought about that. There's definitely, yeah, like you said, there's a, there's a gap, whether people are bringing your horses over from Europe or staying at home and, you know, purchasing local and making investments that way, there needs to be a solid place to take those young horses to give them that start and that foundation and you guys again it all comes down to details so I think that's where mm -hmm. your success comes comes through yeah all right oh absolutely we're, and we're having yes yeah <laughs> all right so let's talk a little bit more about Hazelcrest um Again, so it's all about um, you found yourself in this niche of young horse development, um, and it, you have you provide a bit of a schooling program. Am I correct? So, like bringing in young riders that uh, want to learn how to ride, or whether they be you know younger in age or older in age, um, and molding them into accomplished athletes. Can you share a little bit about your? yours and Scarlett's philosophy behind what it is you want to do. Yeah. So I, I, I think am the drill sergeant at home, not for all of the littles, but you know, if ever there's somewhere that Scarlett has to be and I'm left farm and it's a Saturday morning and we've got lessons rolling in most of our littles at this point know that little will we jump, more will we work on slowing things right down. Because you see these littles, you see them. They're getting on fancy ponies too, and the reins are long, and they're not grabbing hold of that mane with the reins tight and swinging their leg. Even I've caught some riders getting on on the right side. You know, so uh, I'm 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 that guy <laughs> for our school. 
and and scarlet she she will teach she will teach those littles how to find the jumps and so like i said before it's it's a perfect blend of horsemanship and teaching them the competitive aspect of it and she's just as detailed as i am she will say to those little do not let that pony cut that corner you know keep it out on the rail you know and and it can sound like um i'm sure you know at the end of the day you've said outside rain probably three million times (laughs) (laughs) um but but it's necessary, you know. Those basics are necessary, right? Because if you don't teach them then, then they'll never understand the importance of it later on. Uh-huh. And so, it, we we focus on on many aspects, and you know we're proud of it too. Um, the 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 people that show up, even if it's brand new to them, um, can see Scarlett and I just as dirty as the rest of our staff you know like we don't leave the barn with clean t-shirts and super polished boots like we are very much hands-on and I think what better way for uh, the children to learn what it's really like uh, than to see it actually happening from us you know Mm -hmm. What's the age, what's the age range of these littles that you're calling them? I love that. That's so cute. <laughs> yeah. Uh, two. Esme's two. Okay. Oh yeah. Esme's two years old. And, and how, I, uh, how- you guys, you, you parents be careful if they're around horses enough, they try to get on one and that's what happened. <laughs> and so, and, and uh, so, okay. If it's somebody else's child, I wouldn't suggest that they can start getting up down lessons at the age of two years old but i mean they can most certainly come and learn what it's like uh to to pick a horse's hoof safely and and brush and i mean i've got uh uh, high school buddies that reach out to me now just from the power of of social media and they say oh they want to bring their children up and you know just find something to do and you know of course within the correct uh protocols and restrictions we we cater to that it's it's enjoyable for for um people that aren't even really in it just to come and see what it's like you know yeah and and then i i find that in fact it's uh therapeutic in some cases um that you know a mother that is a single mom just can open her child's eyes to something that they never even knew was a thing you know well and i think that that touches on um i mean i know you and i have similar thoughts about the healing power of horses um and you know how they are often a mirror to us for us to hopefully yeah. open up our eyes and learn something about ourselves, right? Totally. Yeah, you can <laughs> you can learn about somebody through what their horse does. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> you know, uh, and and so we we try to instill that kind of awareness as well in in the 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 children from a very early age and of course with our own children uh, i mean everly she she will horse show she might she might go over yonder you know right after undress and go play but let me tell you that pony gets a bath that pony gets a graze after the pony gets a graze it gets a curry and a brush if it's had a little jump, uh, not too big, it's front legs get wrapped. She she knows. She knows. Awesome. Awesome. And and not because old to, she wants to, you know? Yeah. Well, I think you yeah. guys are providing something that, that's kind of missing right now. Or like there's there's not a lot of schooling places to go that provide that kind of of detail and and good start um for kids and so it's inspiring good for you guys you're going to make a difference 
Yeah, I think we, I think we are. We for sure have made a difference in a lot of people's lives. And so I think, you know, we we're definitely wanting to provide that kind of atmosphere, that kind of sanctuary, not, not making it so serious, but then serious enough that, you know, the people that enter know that this is our livelihood too. Yeah. Right. And this, our family and and so you know people that want to be a part of that have have uh, have a great time Good. yeah what have you found to be the biggest challenge that ray butterfield has had to deal with along the way what's been your biggest challenge uh definitely having to sit out for a number of years when I was a seller and not a rider. That was, that was tough. So sorry, a saddle was, thinner? Is that what? A seller. Yeah. I okay. used to sell, sell saddles for CWD. Okay. Uh, great company. And, uh, but it was, it was tough. Just, it was tough keeping my mouth shut sometimes in certain situations. <laughs> uh, <laughs> And, uh, you know, but that's, I was not there to do that. I was there to represent a company. And so um, it, it was, it was, that was the toughest, but also uh, definitely one of the good life lessons that I had learned is that, you know, you can, you can be strong, uh, but you, but you don't always have to prove yourself in a sense does that make does that make sense there i think so yeah no um yes. and, and so it uh was difficult being you know at the competitions but not a competitor and you know because i had known i had known what it was like for so long and it was my choice it was my choice to to do what I did, um, and, and, and sell saddles. Um, but, uh, it was, it was hard. It was hard some days for sure. So mm. you did that for six years, you said? Six years. Yeah. yeah. So and it was, a, it was a good six years. You know, I don't regret it. I don't regret it because I think, I think, uh, one thing that I was, uh missing that in fact being a seller taught me was the business aspect mm. of it I, I definitely um got to see you know and would hear through certain conversations how those trainers handled uh customers and you know horse deals that were going on and the sort of all the behind the scenes work that's done to achieve that um but working for cwd definitely taught me the business aspect or at least you know some administrative detail that you should also understand and probably most importantly how it feels to be a customer hmm in not just the trainer but how customers uh respond to everything that's happening right interesting and so yeah. i think that i think that gave me a bit of an advantage you know to then saying okay like i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna put my neck out there and really become one of these guys mm -hmm. and i think it that it was probably the best thing I could have ever done because I'm mixing my livelihood with something that I'm absolutely in love with, you know? Right. So, um, yeah. I was able to gather uh, information from very different areas before I made that choice. Hmm. But, uh, you know, before all of that, yeah, I would say that it was difficult, you know, wanting to be... Um, or wanting to give information, but knowing that also there was a very clear line where you can't force somebody to do something that they don't want to do. Yeah. Know? 
Exactly. You can give them your knowledge, you can give them your input, your opinion, whatever it may be, but in the end, they make the final decision. I know it's hard. I, I deal with that a lot with the massaging. Um, and some people are open to learning and others aren't, and you just kind of have to do what you can. And that's, that's all you can do. And, and, and just be really okay with, you know, with that. That's, I think, uh, one of the very precious lessons that I learned was that if, if someone doesn't want to buy a saddle from you or if someone doesn't want to buy a horse from you or whatever the case is, or even if they disagree with you, they're allowed to be. It doesn't mean that they hate you mm -hmm. or that they think the person is just, that's the way they think and that's okay. Yeah. Yep, exactly. You know? it, it can be that simple. <laughs> It can be that simple. And I find, I find that that uh, looking through it, through that lens um, creates, you know, a, a more comfortable industry, you know, generally speaking, like if you give, if you provide the opportunity for open discussion, it, it doesn't always have to be your way, you know, and, and and then sometimes that leads to you as a person learning something more than you than you thought you did and 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 um and then i think people tend to trust you a little bit more too when you have that little bit of vulnerability about you you know absolutely absolutely i don't I don't, I don't know. I'm big on vulnerability. I think everybody has something to learn from, from each other. And the only way we're going to do that is if we share. And it, and let's, like we said, you know, it, just because someone might not like you and, and the industry is so, so multi-layered in so many different areas. Um, but yeah, like you said, communication is so important and to have a conversation with someone and and find out they might be a little vulnerable in one area can lead to better relationship better knowledge totally. you know shared experience totally the, the 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 transparency uh in fact i would say at about year three of working uh with cwd because when I came in, you know, I went to training in France. They send all of the, the reps to France to train first before they hire. And everyone knew that I was a rider. And so I kind of, looking back on it now, was a little cocky with what we were being taught. Because the very first lesson is, okay, this is the saddle. And I'm like, ah, that's, that's, you know. <laughs> that kind of you know and so um i forget where i was going with this but uh yeah i can't remember my point sorry, sorry that's okay <laughs> you were talking about in france and you were a little cocky because you knew you know they were certain aspects but you learned more about yourself through this process yeah yeah, I did. I, I can't remember where I was going with that, but it was going to be really good. I think it might come back. Okay. <laughs> okay. Awesome. All right. If it comes back to you, you just let me know. I let, will. Let's talk about how, you know, every rider, and I'm sure riders listening to this will totally attest to the fact that every rider has that one special horse and uh -huh. your special horse that kind of you know, really brought you up through the ranks and taught you a ton. Her name was Gemini de, de Terlong. Like you said, she's a French mare. Um, what was it about your relationship with her that gave you the confidence to be a better rider? And have you been able to carry any of those lessons that she taught you into the equine partnerships that you have now or in human relationships? Because sometimes those horses can teach us more than just about horses. Oh, totally. She, she was the boldest, bravest mare I had ever met. And um, I mean, what a privilege. I, I remember trying her in 
Tampa, Florida, and she she just about nearly jumped me right off her back. <laughs> and this was like in front of the whole horse show, you know. I I I think it was uh, I, per- I perhaps think it was Norman Norman Del Joyo that who was good friends with Mac at the time, and um, he knew of the horse, and the horse I think was owned by uh, Dara Cairns, an Irish rider, and so. Uh, you know, I, 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 I remember not being cocky in that moment. I was very <laughs> collected because I, I didn't really know what to expect. And that, that, that whole trying a horse at that level um, um, was, that was new. That was, that was something that I had never done before. And right from day one, Gemini, she wore her ears right to the back of her neck. You know, and she eat a little bit from time to time. Um, but that's not what we were buying her for. Like Mac had obviously seen a lot of scope in that horse and the bravery and the boldness is what I needed at the time to move on to the new level. And the new level was like she was going to be a young rider's horse potentially. Okay. And she ended up horse. And so what I learned from her was that she was the way that she was, and there was not a darn thing that I was going to do about it. And I had to be okay with that, right? And um, I remember, I remember being in Max uh, barn a couple of times, and we'd, we'd just be at home. And I remember, like, I'm just going to try and get this mare's mouth a little softer you know, just a little bit, and mm -mm, wasn't happening, (laughs) and, and so she, she, she taught me how to almost just be still, and to almost trust the process, um, kind of thing, and, and I mean, I feel that way about my business now, when I speak to people, you know, I, I, I let them know, you know, that, they're in good hands, their animal is in good hands, and we trust the process. Yeah. You know, who knows? Yeah. Who knows what could happen, right? Trust the process. Um, mm-hmm. and, and so she, I would say, is the one horse that stands out. And I mean, because I almost, looking back on it now, took for granted what she would do for me. I mean, there's no way that I was perfectly accurate every single time I wrote her. I wasn't, but it didn't matter. So um, why would I go and try and change that, right? Right. So what, what did she help you learn about human interaction? Um, that... If it's a strong, bold woman, no need to go and change that. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness! So it does. Uh, does... Sorry, go ahead. go ahead. No, you go ahead. Uh, I I I don't think that I was going to say anything that that was going to be. Uh, <laughs> my goodness yeah these horses have a way of teaching us so much and I like I think you know I I think back to some of mine and it all comes down to communication right and and whether or not uh, I think you and I talked about this previously whether it be like whether you have to express an opinion or or whether that opinion just be laid to rest kind of thing right was it something along that line Yes, yes. Um, and as you were saying that, I was thinking of a, a word to use. But, you know, I think I've, I've said it, you know, earlier on, just to just how, whether you're in the ring or not, or you're in, you can be in an argument. Come on, we all are ups and partners, or 
you know, our animals or whatever. And not all the time you have to respond or mm -hmm. even say anything, you know, and sometimes just being still is the, 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 the medicine that, you know, a, a, a certain uh, thing in your life needs to just get better or, you know, and so um, that I would say is also something that I learned from not just riding Gemini, but, you know, sort of the importance of that horse just being placed in my life. And so being still and recognizing all of the things that it's providing for you, you can quickly just take for granted something that's so precious sitting in front of you, you know? Wow. That is lovely. And I don't know if you could uh, get much more eloquent than that as far as what, uh, what she taught you and what they're uh, able to teach us. So thank you, my friend. This has been wonderful. No problem. Yeah. So we are going to put, um, how can people get a hold of you and Scarlett? Do you guys have a website? Are you all social media? I know you guys are pretty active on Instagram. Uh, that would, the Instagram, I don't know how to operate Instagram. I think it is uh, actually a lot more simple, I've been told, than Facebook. Um, <laughs> okay. but all, all kudos to Scarlett. She uh, is the one that, that makes us look so good okay. online. Uh, we don't have um, a website. I think we are are thinking about getting one. Okay. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, we're easy to find. You can message us on on Facebook. I think perhaps even both of our numbers are on okay. our Facebook page. All right. Well, yeah, we can put the put your um, links up to your Facebook and your Instagram on the show notes and people can uh, check you guys out, reach out to you guys. If, if there's um, a bunch of hazel crests, then I think just click on the one that has uh, a five year old with blonde curly hair and right. that'll be us. <laughs> Everly. Okay. Awesome. Well, thank you, my friend. Thank you for taking the time. This has been wonderful. No, no problem at all, Tracy. It's a pleasure.